is one of the biggest challenges you'll face in your PhD. Apart from all the technical difficulties of doing your research, is simply staying focused. So very often I will hear from students who say that it's really hard for them to stay focused on a particular task and they get distracted by checking email or Facebook or news headlines or whatever else. Or maybe they start on one task and then they can't stay focused so they jump to another task and then they jump to something else and they end up just overloaded by the different things that they're trying to do. So whenever this situation comes up, I always start with a really simple question and that is, where is your attention supposed to be? Do you have a single point of focus, a single well-defined task that you want to direct your attention to? Because if you don't have that, then your brain will automatically go for the default habit. It will go for whatever is easiest, which is usually the thing that you do most often. So if you have a, if you have a habit of checking email, that will be what you do when you're in any doubt about what you should do or where your focus should, should be. So in order to define that, in order to get that single point of focus, if you're trying to decide that at the point where you sit down to work, it's already a little bit late because you're already in that situation of doubt. You're arriving in a position of doubt. So we want to do it a little bit before, preferably the day before or the evening before. So people are really good at creating long-term plans. So very often I'll see PhD students produce these amazing long-term plans covering several weeks or several months, or in some cases, a few years. It might all be color-coded, amazing Gantt charts with different themes of different tasks and all of these kind of things. But then those tasks, uh, sorry, those plans are often very difficult to follow and when you fall behind, it becomes kind of a burden that you're failing to live up to. So in order to be able to follow through on those long-term plans, you need to be able to follow through on a short-term plan. If you can't plan and execute in a single day, how do you expect to be able to do it over several weeks or several months? So to create these short-term plans, you want to take some time at the end of every day to plan the next one. So if you take 10 to 15 minutes maybe and try to set a small number of priorities because you want to focus your attention instead of trying to do everything. Now when you do this, you might have a million different tasks in your mind, but we don't want to create a to-do list that has everything on it because then if you do you know, one or two things, you know, it feels like you've barely made a dent in this massive amount of work that you have to do. So it's kind of discouraging. But if you have a to-do list of two or three things, let's say there's three things on your list and you manage to do two of them, then it doesn't feel like too much of a stretch to get to do all three. And then that feels like a success. It feels like you're making a tangible step in the right direction. And that's the kind of feeling that we want. These psychological things make a massive, massive difference. So if you need to, then you can write down all of the things on your mind just to get them out of your mind and onto paper. But then you want to identify what your priority should be. You know, what two or three things are you going to, are you going to actually do? So take another piece of paper and just write down those two or three things. Now it's okay. If you have a lot of little tasks to do that need to be done urgently, that don't require much creativity or problem solving. So let's say you need to go online and pay a bill, for example, really easy, kind of thing that you want to remember to do. It doesn't take any cre creativity. You can put 10 of those things on, not a big deal, but we want a limited number of things that actually require some thought and creativity and problem solving. Okay, so that needs to be small number, two or three things. When you finish them, if you finish them early, of course, you can add more things. You just refer to the bigger list, but we don't want a massive, massive list. So take this time at the end of the day, then in the morning, when you arrive at work, you know what you need to do. So you can just take a couple of minutes, look at that list, set your priorities, try and get in the right headspace to get the work done. 
Now, even if you have this, even if you have this clear point of focus and you're determined, you're energized, it's then really easy to slip into bad habits and start checking email and those things because it's kind of automated, it's habitual. So what we wanna do, instead of relying on willpower, which takes a lot of energy that you need to direct to the work, we want to just remove that option as much as possible. So what I do is I use a website blocker called Cold Turkey, and I'll set a timer, usually for about two hours, where I can't access email, I can't access Facebook, I can't access YouTube, I can't access Amazon, I can't access um, the news websites that I usually look at. Anything that is a habitual distraction, my kind of default places where I go to distract myself, that's all blocked during, during that time. So I've got a little bit of space where I can actually, where I can, I can actually work and I'm not relying on willpower during that time. It's an absolutely essential tool and it's a, it's a complete, complete lifesaver. So when you do this, you will probably still find the temptation and you'll find yourself clicking on the browser and then the notification comes up saying it's saying it's blocked. That's natural, that's normal. Again, because it's automated. But after it happens a couple of times, because you don't get the reward, it's quite easy to break the, break the habit. But one extra thing that you can do to help with this is whenever you have these temptations, just make a note of the time and what the distraction was. So with pen and paper, you can write down um, 9.05 a.m tempted to check email. Typically when I do this, it will be 9.05, tempted to check email, 9.06, tempted to check email. It starts off being really, really frequent, even though seconds ago, you know, you noted the distraction and you tried to go back. It's, you know, you've got that thing pulling you in that direction. But again, after a couple of times, the temptation fades. And because you're making a note of those times, and you know, it doesn't have to be times when you actually click on the browser, it's just the thought coming up. If you notice the thought arising and write it down, we're putting in an intermediate step. You know, we're interrupting that, uh, that habitual action. And eventually you can train yourself to just notice the thought arising and then just let it go and put your attention back on the work. But it takes a little bit of time and practice, not very long, but it takes a little, bit of, a little bit of time at least. So once you've started, again, there might be temptations if not to check email. Let's assume we've just trained that habit out. I know it's you know, a bit more complicated than that, but let's just assume that temptation isn't there. Maybe you're tempted to change, a t change tasks because the thing that you're working on, it's a little bit difficult. Um, you know, it's a little bit uncomfortable. You, know, you don't know what, this, what the solution is. I would say just stay with it for a little bit longer. Try and, try and set a timer for say 45 minutes or 90 minutes and just say, during this time, I'm just going to think about and work on this particular, this particular task. You might be less productive in the short term, but you're giving yourself the opportunity to solve the problems that arise. And you're training that ability to stay with the problems that arise. The temptation is often to switch tasks, to stay busy, but then what happens is you train yourself to switch every time you, fa you face a problem, and then none of the difficult problems in your PhD actually get solved. So you stay busy, you stay stressed, but then you're not making any progress. And that's a really bad place to be. So we wanna try and just stay with the problem for a little bit longer than is initially initially comfortable. And if you've got a defined amount of time, okay, I'm gonna stay with this for 45 minutes or an hour and a half, something like that, a decent amount of time, um, but not too long, you know, it's manageable, then I think that's a really, really important habit to, to develop. So these are the foundational habits that I think everybody needs to develop. And, these are the things that I always try to go back to when things are going wrong. So it's not just when I'm working with, with students, but for myself as well. If things are starting to fall apart, 
I ask myself, am I doing these foundational things? And these are the first things that I try and put back into my, into my routine because it's always easy to slip into bad habits and forget about these, um, these, these foundational things. The next thing I would suggest to help with developing focus is to take real breaks. So often what will happen is you'll work for a set period of time, and then as soon as you stop that focused work, when you take a break, you go straight back to those same default habits. So checking email, um, pulling out the phone. This is so, 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 so common that a lot of people think it's not a big deal. But when you check email or your phone, you're not giving yourself a break because it's all this incoming information. So you come out of this kind of intense focused period of work and then you're being bombarded with other, other stuff, this massive amount of, amount of information. So physically, you're not taking a rest because you're still sat at the computer or your eyes are still looking at a screen, whether it's your computer or your phone. And mentally, you're not having a rest because you're suddenly being bombarded with this, with this information. So you don't have a chance to process the work that you've done. You don't have a chance to just kind of reset and prepare yourself for the next bit of work that you have to do. So another crucial habit that I'd encourage everyone to try to develop is to take breaks where you're not facing a screen. So it might be 10 minutes, 20 minutes, leave your phone on your desk or you know, somewhere, somewhere that nobody's gonna steal it and, or turn it off and just go for a walk for 10 minutes, 20 minutes or so without any incoming information and just let yourself relax a little bit. You don't have to rush into the next, into the next, next task and you don't want all of, that, all of that incoming information. So a lot of people find this quite difficult because they're not used to being disconnected. They're not used to just being in their own head and um, dealing with their own thoughts. You know, we, we have all of this distraction, this kind of anesthetic that stops us from having to deal with things. But then what happens is you then go to bed and it's your first opportunity throughout the day to actually deal with the thoughts that you've got. So then the thoughts start going round and round and round in your head, and then you can't sleep, and then you're tired the next day, and it makes everything much more, much more difficult. So I really recommend taking those real breaks without any incoming information away from, away from the screen. Now, all of these things are kind of basic foundational habits that I think everybody should try to develop, but there is one complication, and that is, some people will experience extreme anxiety or panic sometimes when they're trying to work. And in those situations, it's incredibly hard to focus and to do the creative work that you need to. So the first thing you need to do is try and bring that anxiety level down. The way to do this, there are a few ways to do this. One is to move your body. So when you have overwhelming stress, the body prepares itself for action, fight or flight. So by burning off some of that energy, you naturally reduce some of the, some of the stress. So you can burn off some energy by going for a walk or a run or going to the gym, depending on how much energy you need to burn off. And usually that will reduce the level of anxiety somewhat. Another way to do it is to just, again, take a, take a break, go for a walk, and, uh, and just let your thoughts be. And naturally, if you actually let yourself feel the feeling, it will fade. You don't stay at that peak level of anxiety. It usually starts to, um, starts to drop if you give it a little bit of space. I would add one more thing, which is if this is happening regularly, then you should seek professional help. There are people who are trained to deal with these things, um, you don't have to deal with all of these things on your on your own, and you know help is help is available. So seek it out. There's absolutely no shame in seeking it out. Um, sometimes people think that they have to be the independent researcher. They should be able to deal with everything themselves. Um, it's you know it's it's not it's not true. 
and um, I've sought help before. What during my PhD, I went to see the um, see the counselling service, and more recently, I've been to see a therapist as well, just to help out with some stuff because everybody needs help at at certain at certain points. But once you are able to reduce the level of anxiety, it comes back again to this basic habit. Where does your attention need to be? If you've got that point of focus, then you know when you get distracted, you know where to bring your attention back to. So it always comes back to this foundational habit of setting your setting your your priorities. So I hope you found that useful. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up because that helps other people to find it on YouTube. Also, if you'd like to know more, then you can check out my website, which is jameshaytonphd.com, where I've got hundreds of blog posts on all kinds of different PhD-related issues, dealing with literature, dealing with stress, dealing with supervisors, time management, writing, all of these kind of things. And if you'd like more detailed guidance, check out the PhD Academy. I'll put a link in the description below, but it's phd.academy is the, is the URL where we've got detailed step-by-step -step courses. We do weekly Zoom calls. There's a whole community of other PhD students as well. Um, so check that out uh, with the link below. So that's it from me. Best of luck, and I'll see you next time.